God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Good job, guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight to Kingdom Voices Community Church. Let us all stand and be one in prayer. I say it all the time, and it's so true. I don't know if you've ever been to a courtroom. I have been to a courtroom once or twice. And there's power when they tell you to stand up for a human judge. You know, you stand up for a human judge and you have no problem standing up. We have no problem in a Celtics game standing up. We have no problem screaming for Tom Brady and things like that. And we have to have that same honor, that same reverence for God. You know, that same, that same respect where we stand up and we pray and when we read the word of God. So I just want to pray. Uh, Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you in the name of Jesus. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, give us understanding in the name of Jesus. Give us authority in the name of Jesus. Father, anoint us in the name of Jesus. Lord, love us in the name of Jesus. Lord, give us salvation in the name of Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread in the name of Jesus. Father, you set us free in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for your kingdom to come and your will be done as it says in Matthew. Father, let your kingdom advance and be established through the preaching, teaching, and healing according to your word. Father, let the gates of our city be opened up for the king of glory. Lord Jesus, you reign, you're clothed in majesty and in strength. Your throne is established from old. Jesus, you go from everlasting to everlasting. Lord, you are great and you are mighty above all gods and above all kings, Lord. Lord, let the heathen hear that the Lord reigns. According to the psalmist in 96, Father, your word says that you reign and let the people tremble and let the earth be moved. Lord, you have prepared your throne in the heavens according to your kingdom which rules all over. Father, in the name of Jesus, let men bless the Lord in all places of his dominion. Father, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. Let men speak of the glory of your kingdom according to the talk and will of your power. Father, let all men know your mighty acts and your glorious majesty for your kingdom. Jesus, we just ask you that you help us to empty us of ourselves right now and fill us with your Holy Spirit again right now for the first time. Lord, we don't want to just be here today to just say that we came to church. We want an encounter with you. Lord, we, let your word convict us. Let your word cleanse us. Let your word correct us. Let your word love us, Lord. Lord, let your word make us into who you've called us to be. We want to be in the potter's hands, Lord. We want to be remade. Father, we want to be a seed that dies so that we can bear fruit. Father, we want you to prune us so that we can bear much fruit for your glory, God. Jesus, we just love you. We cannot say it enough. We love you. Lord, thank you for this church and all the churches, Lord, that are preaching your word for your gain, for your righteousness, Lord. We pray all of this in the mighty, majestic, and miraculous name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for today. We have a, a speaker here for tonight that we are, God is going to use this man. We are going to be blessed. Um, if you could put that image up, please. I've been saying since we opened this church, you never know who you're going to cross paths with. You never know who you're saying hello to and what is going to happen later on. You never know somebody that you think you just met, what that person is going to mean in your life, how that person is going to come into your life and help you fulfill what God has done. There's an image that the uh, guys are going to put up. I wrote um, two books as many of you know, and the second book that I wrote, I wanted a different editor. And I went on Facebook and I made a post on Facebook. Um, go ahead and be seated, excuse me. I made a post on Facebook and someone tagged someone that tagged someone. And this is the book that I wrote. So someone tagged someone that tagged someone and they said that, told them that I needed an editor. So this guy that was tagged, he came on starts talking to me and I hire him he says he's going to help me edit the book and blah 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 this is a non-christian book it's a nursing book that I wrote on how to invent medical devices it was something that I wanted to do um, separate outside of the kingdom but I did put a, at the end of the book the gospel so when somebody reads it um, they'll still have an opportunity to to receive Jesus Christ 
At that time, I was in Bible school, which many of you know that I graduate tomorrow. So I'm speaking to uh, Bob McLaren, who's right here to my right. And he says, oh, you're in Bible school. And I said, yeah. I dropped out of Bible school in the master's program because it was too difficult after I took two classes. I hate writing papers. I just hate writing papers. I still hate writing papers. And, but God told me to go back to school during an altar call when I went to go visit somebody's church for the first time. When I went to the altar call, the, the Holy Spirit came upon this pastor. He didn't know anything about me. And he said, God said to go back to school and to get your doctorate and that he was going to pay for it. That next Monday, I went and signed back up to school. That's how much I knew and I trusted that that was the word of God. Sometimes God speaks into your life and you have to take a step to show God that you believe that that was God, right? God is not, God didn't bring me to school and, sign, and take my hand and sign me up. God didn't open the book for me and stick my face in the book. There was a part that I had to do. But when God told me that he was going to help me, I didn't know how much he was going to help me. So when I met Bob and I said to him that I was in Bible school, he said, oh, I have a ministry. I said, oh, what's your ministry? And he said, my ministry is I help people write papers for Bible school. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, really? And my, my goal for sharing this with you is to remember that you need people. You need people to help you. The Bible says that we prophesy in part and we know in part. And I believe that God made it that way because you need your brothers and sisters that are next to you you need help nobody has the complete prophecy like the this church this church is incomplete without your input on this church it's incomplete we prophesy in part and we know in part the the, the purpose of your life that God wants you to fulfill, you're going to have to reach out to your brothers and sisters and people that you don't know that they're going to help you and in turn you help them. So Bob became my tutor and I want to encourage you that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to not know. It's okay to not understand certain things of your life I know the areas of my life where I am very strong I don't need God in those areas where I'm strong you don't need God in the areas where you're strong but the Bible says that in your weakness he is strong so my weakness I reached out to someone in my weakness so that I could fulfill what God was doing in my life I didn't know that when I signed up for school that God was going to bless me with a church until I got a year and a half into the master's program and then it made sense. It made sense why God had me studying to that degree, why God was doing this in my life, but I had to step out in faith in order to see it. And Bob walked with me each class each paper it was back and forth back and forth and he took time he poured into me we got to know one another um, intimately we, we prayed together we've cried together we prayed for each other's families together and I wanted to I wanted to bless him and I said I, I said when I if I ever get a church I want you to come and preach at my church and then the Lord gave me a church and now you're going to preach at the church. Amen. <laughs> I just want to call up Bob McLaren. Let's clap not for him, but let's clap for the Holy Spirit in him. There are a lot of uh, prophetic words. Come on, brother, please. There are a lot of prophetic words that are, are happening now. Guys, you can take that off the screen that are happening right now. And, um, we serve a living God. There's people that say that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak, that the canon of Scripture is closed, that everything that God has to say is already in His written word. And I understand, I do believe that that's true. But I also believe that God speaks yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God spoke to me like He will speak to you. God spoke to him and he helped me. I prophesied because God showed me that he was going to preach one day. I'm encouraging you with this testimony that you need people in your life
to fulfill what God is doing in your life. So Bob, I'll just come and I'll pray for you. Bob, thank you for helping me achieve this degree. I graduate tomorrow. I said, Bob, how many degrees do you have? He said, I have two. He said, but after tomorrow, I'm going to have three. <laughs> I told them that when they hand me the degree, I'm just going to come down the stage and just give them half, and then he can go back home. Thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we just thank you because you are a God of unity. You're a God of fellowship. Lord, you bring people together for greater things in your kingdom. Father, help humble us, Lord, and, re and help us realize that we, we do need help. We cannot do it on our own. Father, help us to realize that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to not know, but it's not okay to quit. It's not okay to step out in faith. Father, thank you for bringing him here from Virginia. Uh, we know his wife Trina couldn't come. We pray for her and the children in the name of Jesus. May the Lord be with them continually. Bob, we pray over your ministry. We thank you for your patience. Thank you for helping me write uh, my book. Thank you for helping other people in this church write their future books so we know that you'll be back again. Thank you for your ministry. Your, your humility is your strength. Father, use him today to deliver us a word in season. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Pastor Brian, can you do me one favor? Yes, sir. Um, can you uh, get me a couple of waters that yeah. got stolen? <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. Yes, yes. I, I have been longing for this night and this weekend. Praise God, man. I know you don't know this, but since day one of, that this church opened, I've seen every service on Facebook. I feel, and thank you so much, I feel an automatic connection to you. And um, I'm just so honored to be here. Praise God. I'm honored. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for inviting me. I, uh, I was praying, I think Pastor Brian asked me maybe back in February or so, maybe, uh, if I would come. And I was praying and I said, Lord, what can I do? And I, you know, as I was following on Facebook and, you know, in the services, I noticed that, you know, I know tonight is repentance night and, and I was, you know, following, you know, the repentance nights and, you know, because I didn't really want to do a repeat of anybody and I noticed that, um, that a lot of the, the services of the repentance were kind of like broad and generic, and, and I didn't want to do that. So tonight, we are really going to zero in on something very, very, very specific. And we'll broaden it at the very end, but for the 99% the of it, I want to zero in on one subject and it's something that's very crucial. Something that applies to each and every one of us. So before we open the Word of God, I just want to ask if you'd bow your heads with me one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I am truly grateful for the opportunity that I have to deliver your word to this body of people. And I thank you, Lord, that you dropped this subject into my heart. And I knew from the very moment that you dropped it into my heart that you gave it to me. And so, Lord, I believe that you are going to do some wonderful and miraculous things here tonight. I believe wholeheartedly with all my heart that what you have started, you will complete. I believe with all my heart, God, and I thank you in advance for what you are about to do in these next few minutes. 
Lord, I thank you in advance that you are going to do miracles. I thank you, Lord, in advance for transforming lives here tonight. I thank you in advance, God, for what you are about to do, exceeding and abundantly above all that we'd ask or think, according to the power that already works within us. And so, Lord, we dedicate everything to you. Be glorified in it all. And I thank you in Jesus' precious name. And everyone say it. Amen. 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 I heard a story a couple of years ago. How many have ever heard of Dr. Harry Ironside? Anybody? Anyone? Dr. Ironside was a famous preacher, a famous theologian, and he was invited to speak at a particular church one day, and just before the service started, he thought he would grab a, uh, a church bulletin. And he noticed that there was a paragraph at the bottom of the bulletin, and, and it read something to the effect of the following, where the pastor is, was greatly troubled. And so be, uh, because he had heard a rumor that his wife went to a particular meeting, uh, some kind of a heretical meeting, and, this, and that this pastor got so angry that he went to that meeting, literally dragged his wife out of the meeting by the hair, took her home, beat her. And so the pastor went on to explain. He says, look, none of this never happened. I never went to a meeting. I have never, ever dragged my wife by the hair. I have never, ever beat my wife. And finally, bachelor, and I don't even have a wife. <laughs> Needless to say, I think that church had a slight problem with gossip. <laughs> it's kind of interesting how rumors get started, isn't it? And it's almost, you know, it's, it's little wonder sometimes that, that they do. It, it's, it's it, you know, the, it, just the way people communicate. The following, which I, I want to read to you, is a series of actual quotes from insurance forms, uh, insurance and accident forms. Notice this. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree I don't have. The other car collided without giving warnings of its intentions. I thought my window was down, but I found it was up when I put my hand through it. I collided with a stationary truck coming the other way. <laughs> a truck backed through my windshield into my wife's face. A pedestrian hit me and went under my car. The guy was all over the road and I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Think about that one for a moment. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. In my attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telephone pole. I had been shopping for plants all day and was on my way home. As I reached an intersection, a hedge sprang obscuring my vision, and I did not see the other car. I had been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. I was on my way to the doctors with rear end trouble when my universal joint gave way causing me to have an accident. The car was legally parked as it backed into the other vehicle. That makes sense, doesn't it? An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle, and vanished. I told the police that I was not injured, but removing my hat, I found a skull fracture. The pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. I was sure the old fellow would never make it to the other side of the road when I struck him. 
The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. I was thrown from my car as it left the road. I was later found in a ditch by some stray cows. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. And finally, I was unable to stop in time. My car crashed into the other vehicle. The driver and the passenger then left immediately for a vacation with injuries. You know, we have some interesting ways of communicating, don't we? <laughs> You know, gossip is like a balloon. It seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger with every puff, doesn't it? You know, one of the reasons why so many people struggle with gossip and we love to hear gossip, you know, Proverbs 18.8 tells us that the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles and they go right down into the in our innermost beings you know it's something that's like I just want more I just want more I, it almost like you know it's it's like oh tell me more you know I once heard a story about a one woman who was telling another woman a, a juicy bit of gossip and the and the the second woman says well tell me more and the woman says I've already told you more than I've heard <laughs> The fact of the matter is, there are no idle rumors. Rumors are always busy. Don't listen to one. Dr. James Brown was, a, was the uh, former uh, professor at the Assemblies of God Graduate School in Springfield, Missouri, and he used to say this, and I quote, Gossipers and their listeners both ought to be hung, one by the ear, the other by the tongue. God. And it's true. Now, we've had a little fun this, uh, today, you know, in this introduction part of it, but I want you to know something, that gossip is no laughing matter. Gossip is serious business. We've all heard the saying, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Have you heard that? Maybe you said that as a child in school, you know. Uh, you know, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's not true because words do hurt. And for some people, they leave scars for life. Gossipers take many forms in the scriptures. You may read words like this, backbiters, slanderers, whisperers, malicious talkers, tale bearers, busybodies, and the list goes on. If you have modern translations, some of them use the word gossip. According to Marion Webster, gossip is a person who habitually reveals personal or sensational facts. I've come up with my own definition. This is my own personal definition. It's unique entirely to me, but I feel like it's totally accurate. My definition is gossip is sharing personal and or negative information to someone else who is neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. Let me say that again. Gossip is sharing personal and or negative information to someone else who is not part of the problem or part of the solution. Every time we vent our feelings to someone else about someone, and we share that negative information to them, we are gossiping. Plain and simple. If they're not part of the problem or part of the solution. 
every negative word about a coworker to another coworker who's not part of the problem or part of the solution. It's gossip and it's sin. But you might say, well, Bob, if I can't vent my feelings to someone, I'm just going to explode. Well, then do what David did and vent your feelings to God. Where David in so many psalms, oh, Lord, the, uh, my enemies have surrounded me, but you are my strength and my help. Well, let me ask you the question. What is so destructive about gossip? Because we've all heard it, and I'd venture to say we've all done it. <laughs> and most of you know, many of us just say, it's not that big of a deal. Well, let me tell you something, it is to God. And you're about to find that out shortly. Point number one, gossip is a sin. Gossip is a sin. Notice the words in Leviticus 19.16. It says this, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. It doesn't get any more clear than that, right? The New Living Translation of that verse says, Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. If you do, you're disobeying God, and if you're disobeying God, you're, you're, you're sinning. New Testament verse, James 4.11 says this, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Gossip is a sin. You can't water it down. It's a direct commandment. Point number two, gossip is not only a sin, but gossip is a serious sin in the eyes of God. And we should take it seriously as well. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'll, I'll give you a minute to turn there. I want you to, to notice some things at the end of chapter 1, starting in verse number 28. Romans 1, beginning with verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, did you hear what was in that? Did you notice some of those, the elements in that list of things? Murder, wickedness, haters of God, inventors of evil things. Right in the very middle of that list are two back-to-back -back things that are mentioned. Backbiters and whisperers, both a form of gossip. Have you ever considered that gossip is a sin that God takes and puts on par with murder? Gossip is a sin that God puts on the same plain level as haters of God or inventors of evil things? Wow. 
And verse number 32 says that those that practice such things are deserving of death. Folks, this is serious business. And how many times have we taken it so lightly? How many times... Yeah, wow. The end of chapter 1 there that we read, those that practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So if you are one that it says, well, tell me more, you are approving of those that are practicing. So if you've never taken gossip as a serious matter, you need to. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19 tells us that, that there are six things that the Lord hates. Right. Yes, seven are an abomination to Him. What is that seventh thing? The seventh thing is He who sows discord among the brethren. Or in other words, a gossiper. Gossip is an abomination to God. Well, how can that possibly be, you might ask? Let me tell you something. Gossip breaks at least two of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you say, what? What? I don't remember reading that. Let me tell you. Gossip violates the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Because gossip kills relationships. Gossip kills churches. Gossip kills the move of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to do in a body of people. Proverbs 16, 18 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates, kills the best of friends. How many have ever had a friendship that was destroyed because of gossip? Let me see your hands. Yes, yes, many of you. The Bible's true, isn't it? <laughs> you know, in recent years, it's a known fact that young people, as they're being, you know, as, as they're being raised in, in the home and they go, they've gone to church all their lives and then they start going to, to college and then the, the numbers of those that are continuing going to church have just dropped down. And I, you know, I can't help but wonder why, and I'm sure that there are many reasons, you know, we could, we could blame the church maybe, and, and maybe that's part of it, but, you know, I fully, wholeheartedly believe that a major portion of that is because of gossip. Because uh, I can well imagine, and I've witnessed it firsthand, that on the, on the ride home from church, the parents are talking... Can you believe brother or sister so-and-so told me this? Can you believe? That pastor, he just speaks too long. That pastor doesn't tell the truth. You know, he's not strong enough. Or, or you know, he always waters down. It's, you know, it's one or the other. They always have a gift of fault finding. But it's nothing short of gossip. And the, and the kids are like, well, you know, you don't like church. Why should I ever go once I get on my own? Gossip breaks the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Secondly, gossip breaks the commandment, thou shalt not steal. Because gossip steals people's reputations. Gossip has the potential to break a third commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Because if the gossip is a lie or even exaggerated in the slightest, 
you are bearing false witness of that individual. You know, this is a serious matter, isn't it? <laughs> so gossip is a sin. Gossip is a serious sin. Thirdly, gossip is directly following the way of the devil. Directly. Revelation 12.10 tells us, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. You know, we see this portrayed all over the place. Probably maybe the most famous one in the, is maybe the first two chapters in the book of Job. Remember where Job and, or not Job, where, excuse me, where God and Satan are having a conversation? And God says, Satan, what have you been doing? And Satan says, well, I've been, you know, roaming to and fro throughout the earth. And, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? Have, have you seen him? And Satan, right away, he accuses Job. And he accuses God and he says, the only reason Job is serving you is because you've blessed him. It's not true. It wasn't true. And God says, take everything away from him. You're wrong. Satan took everything away. And Job falls down and worships God. <laughs> he said, naked I came into this world and naked I'll go out. I don't care. And he blessed and worshiped God. It's Satan who's the, the accuser of the brethren. How many of you have ever heard that when, when the devil first sinned, he took a third of the angels with him? Have you heard that? How many of you heard that? Let me see your hands, okay? All right, many of you, maybe most of you. Okay, it's true, we get that from uh, Revelation chapter uh, 12, verse number 4. Um, have you ever wondered how he did it? You ever stop and think, well, how in the world would Satan do that? How could he persuade one-third of the angels to fall, you know, the, to go from God to him? Well, I'm going to tell you how he did it. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19, it, it's, it, it, it's, these verses contain a, um, a lamentation for the, for, the, for the king of Tyre. And it's actually like a double reference because it not only addresses the, the king of Tyre, but it also addresses the source behind the king of Tyre, who was the devil himself. And in those verses in uh, Ezekiel 28, 16, you'll read these words, I quote, By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Now notice here, that Hebrew word for trading is the same root word that is translated talebearer and slanderer. In the Leviticus, Proverbs, and Jeremiah. By your tailbearing, by your gossip, you sinned and you took a third of the angels with you. <clears throat> we read in the, the book of 2 Samuel where Absalom killed his half brother. And in order to escape his father's wrath, he, fl he, he fled. And he was kind of lived in isolation for a while, and eventually David brought him back. Absalom was David's son, by the way. David brought him back, and he brought him back to Jerusalem, but David wouldn't go visit him. And so eventually Absalom got tired of it, and 
He says, you know what? I'm going to undercut my dad. And so he went early in the morning. He went to the gates, and it was at the gates where, you know, people would, you know, have court cases and things along that line. And, and uh, you know, and people would start coming, and Absalom would say, oh, you know, you've got a good case here, but there's nobody in my, in, you know, in David's court that will ever hear you. But, but if I were king, if I were in charge, I, I, I'd address it. Because you deserve something. And I really believe this is what, in fact, 2 Samuel 15, 6 says, Thus Absalom stole the hearts away from David. And I really believe this is how Satan persuaded a third of the angels to follow, follow him. As, he's, as he says, you know, he, he would go to one of the angels and say, you know what? You're really doing a good job here, but man, you're far below your potential. You deserve a better place in this, you know, in, the, in governing the universe. But if I were in charge, I'd promote you. He used gossip back then, and he uses gossip today. Gossip split heaven, and gossip is at the heart of virtually every church split today. We are never more like Satan than when we gossip. Because we are following directly in his way. Gossip is a sin. Gossip is a serious sin. Gossip is directly following the way of Satan. Fourthly, God will judge every careless word we speak. Whew. Really? Let me read what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For every idle, for every careless word that men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. I've come up with four-point test, four questions to ask yourself before speaking. Number one, is it true? If you have any doubts of whether it's true, don't repeat it. Number two, is it confidential? If there's any doubt, don't say it. Number three, is it kind? Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Number four, is it necessary? Note this verse, Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. Is it necessary? Psalm 19, 14 says this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. Gossip is a sin. Gossip is a serious sin. Gossip is directly following the way of Satan. God will judge every careless word that we speak. And number five, 
We need to rely upon God's grace and help to tame our tongues. Notice these words out of James chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. James says that no man can tame the tongue. But do you know who can help us? God can. God can. God can. God can. And God does help us. Now I grew up in a, in probably a, a major different background than many of you. I am blessed to say I have never witnessed my parents argue, not once. I have never witnessed my parents raise their voice to the other, not a single time. I have never witnessed my parents use a swear word, not a single time. I have been blessed in that aspect. And so I grew up and I didn't fight, I didn't argue, I don't have a temper problem because I, I was just raised that way. But I was, after I got saved at the age of nine, you know, I, I, I started telling some of my friends about the gospel, but there was something that I was addicted to saying all the time, you know, if something just didn't go right, I'd just say, oh, shoot. Yeah, most of us wouldn't consider that a swear word. Most of us, yeah, hopefully you didn't think I just swore. I hope not. But, you know, forgive me if I did, if you did. But, you know, most of us would say, well, that's just so petty. And I used to think that too until one of my friends says, you know, you keep telling us about Jesus, but you keep saying, you know, you don't swear, you don't use that other S word, you know, swear word. You know, you, you say this, shoot Instead, you're just using a substitute for the swear word. Well, I took that to heart because I didn't want anything to ruin my testimony for God. But I found myself having a problem. <laughs> I couldn't stop saying it. So I decided to take it to the Lord. I tried it on my own strength, but I couldn't do it. And I said, God, I don't have the strength. And I've obviously, this person considers me, you know, substitute swearing. So I need your help. Help me to stop saying it. And you know what? God did just that. And immediately, I stopped saying it. God still does the miraculous. So let me ask you the question tonight. You see, the Bible says that no man can tame the tongue. We can't tame it on our own. And nor can we save ourselves on our own. We need the help of God. You see, if we had the ability to save ourselves on our own, Jesus would not have had to come to this earth to die in our place. But the fact is that Jesus came to this earth, lived it out, showed us how, died as our substitute. He died in our place. And he made it as easy as possible. He says, if you'll trust 
in me, you will be saved. I can change your life. And I will change your life. You may have been born in Adam. You can now be born again in me. And I will change you. 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 He's changed Pastor Brian. He's changed my life. He's changed your lives and so many of your lives. And if you've never received Him as Lord and Savior of your life, I challenge you tonight, I beseech you tonight to receive Him in your life as Lord and Savior. Because He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. Our own good works can never do it. Our own efforts, no matter how good and how noble they might be, can never do it. It's only by the grace of God and the works of God and receiving what He did for us that can do it. Would you stand with me, please? Pastor Brian was kind that Pastor Brian and Eunice were kind enough to put me up in their house for what, three, three, four days, whatever. Um, and I was talking with Eunice earlier. I have seven children. I've been blessed to raise seven children, 17 grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And I have two great-grandchildren, believe it or not. Um, but we were, we were talking, and uh, one of the, the things that came up is, you know, all, all seven of my children are serving God, by the way. Um, <laughs> all, all seven of them have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, too. And uh, God has just done some miraculous things in my family. They all get along well. We all get along well. We've, I mean, and, you know, and I, I was sharing with you, and I, I said, you know, one of the things that we did, and, you know, there are several things we did is we had the philosophy that we wanted our children to be instantly obedient to us so that they would be instantly obedient to God. And so we never used a tactic like, you know, if you don't do this by the time I count to 10, you see, because if you use such a tactic... You are training that child to live in rebellion for the first nine counts because the child knows you're not going to do anything until the count of ten. And so I want to use this same philosophy or whatever you want to call it tonight that if there is anything in this message that has convicted you, then I'm going to ask that you'd step forward and come, and I want to personally pray with you. If, if you've never received Jesus in your